Okay, so this is a video for Act 3, Scene 3. In this scene, we're in Friar Lawrence's cell, and Friar Lawrence um, is delivering the news to Romeo about his banishment and is attempting to console Romeo um, and, and tries to find a solution for the problems that have arisen. Um, in this scene, there's some quite long speeches, particularly from the Friar, as the Friar launches um, quite a lengthy tirade at Romeo. Don't be alarmed if we're not highlighting reams and reams and masses and masses. Largely in this scene, there's a continuation of that theme of the allegory of Verona as the Garden of Eden. And um, I'm going to be explaining that predominantly, um, but equally just explaining the language and talking you through some of the bits that might be trickier. But don't be alarmed if there's not masses and masses of annotations in this scene. Okay. Romeo, come forth, come forth, thou fearful man. Affliction is enamoured of thy parts, and thou art wedded to calamity. And to Romeo, father, what news? What is the prince's doom? So what has the prince said for me? What sorrow craves acquaintance at my hands that I yet know not? Too familiar is my dear son with such sour company. I bring thee tidings of the prince's doom. What less than doomsday is the prince's doom? A gentler judgment vanished from his lips. Nobody, not body's death, but body's banishment. Ha! Huh, banishment? Be merciful, say death. Sir so Romeo would rather death than banishment. Um, for exile hath more terror in his look, much more than death. Do not say banishment. Here from Verona art thou banished. Be patient, for the world is broad and wide. There is no world without Verona walls, but purgatory, torture, hell itself. Now, again here, we've got this continuation, this metaphor, there is no world without Verona walls. The Garden of Eden um, was, was a walled garden. It was effectively um, fenced in or kind of hedged in in lots of the um, images and lots of the, the biblical literature. Um, so this idea of Verona's walls and outside of the walls is hell. Once again, we've got this allegory of Verona being like the Garden of Eden and um, Juliet and Romeo being exiled, being banished for their sins, effectively. Um, and so he, he's saying to him, there, there is no world apart from Verona. I would rather be dead, effectively. And um, he's talking about purgatory as well here. Purgatory is kind of one of the one of the layers of hell kind of prior to um, kind of the, the kind of limbo period caught between heaven and hell. So it's meant to be equally like hell and um, not necessarily torture, but kind of endless punishment um, and, and suffering. Um, so he, he's talking about how, how he can't envisage a world of happiness for himself. Hence banished is banished from the world, and the world's exile is death. Then banished is death mastermind, calling death banished. Thou cuts my head off with a golden axe, and smile upon the stroke that murders me. O oh, deadly sin, O oh, rude and thankfulness, they, thy fault our law calls death, but the kind prince taking thy part hath rushed aside the law and turned that black word death to banishment. This is dear mercy, and thou seest it not. So he's reminding Romeo to be um, grateful. He's saying, look, the law says you should have been killed. Be grateful for what you have here. And um, Romeo continues this idea about heaven and hell and says, heaven is here where Juliet lives. And so it's this idea that paradise, that, that paradise world, that Eden that he sees with Juliet is lost Romeo. Um, if you've not heard the word existentialism, existentialism is kind of questioning your role and place in the world. And so Romeo is kind of forced into this existential hell. He doesn't know where he belongs if he's not with Juliet. He doesn't know what he's supposed to be or how he's supposed to continue. Every cat and dog and little mouse, every unworthy thing live here in heaven and may look on her, but Romeo may not. More validity, more honourable state, more courtship lives in carrion flies than Romeo. They may seize on the white wonder of dear Juliet's hand and seal immortal blessing from her lips. Who, even in pure and vestal modesty, still blush as thinking their own kiss is sin. But Romeo may not. He is banished. Flies may do this, but I from this must fly. They are free men, but I am banished. And sayest thou yet that exile is not death. Hadst that 
thou no poison mix, no sharp ground knife, no sudden mean of ki- some, no sudden mean of death, though ne'er so mean, but banished to kill me, banished, oh friar, the damned use the word in hell, howling attends it, how hast thou the heart, being divine, a ghostly confessor, a sin absolver, and my friend professed to mangle me with that word banished. So he's saying to him, how can you say this is any kind of mercy? How can you be my friend? How can you be a man of God and say to me that I'm banished? I would rather be dead. You're causing me so much suffering. Thou fond madman, hear me a little speak. Oh, thou wilt speak again of banishment. So he says, I don't want to hear you speak. You're just going to speak again of being of me being banished. I'll give thee armour to keep off that word. Adversity, sweet milk, philosophy, to comfort thee though thou art banished. So here, when he says adversity, sweet milk, is philosophy. So the kind of soothing comfort for your hardships is philosophy. He's kind of suggesting that philosophy, thinking about this differently and appreciating what he's been given, is the key to his happiness. He's willing Romeo to be mature and to be calm. Yet banished, hang up philosophy, unless philosophy can make a Juliet, displant a town, reverse a prince's doom, it helps not, it prevails not, talk no more. Oh, then I see madmen have no ears. So basically the friar is saying to him, look, you're not listening to me, clearly you are mad. Um, how should they then, how should they when that wise men have no eyes? Let me dispute with thee of thy estate. Thou canst not speak of that thou dost not feel. Wert thou as young as I, Juliet, thy love, an hour but married, Tybalt murdered, doting like me, and like me banished? Then mightst thou speak, then thou, then mightst thou tear thy hair. Um, I think Romeo here, even though we're talking about the Elizabethan era, is reflecting a lot what teenagers often feel, that idea that that the older generation or their parents just simply don't understand. You don't remember what it was like to be young. You don't remember what it was like to be in love. Um, and this is a kind of perennial, everlasting idea that everybody um, can share in. The idea that Romeo is saying, you older generation simply don't understand matters of the young heart. You can't speak for me unless you felt it effectively. That's what he's saying to the friar. Okay. Again, there's not massive masses of annotations in this next bit, so we'll just read it along. And fall upon the ground as I do now, taking the measure of an unmade grave. Enter the nurse within and knock. Arise, one knocks, good Romeo, hide thyself. Not I, unless the breath of heart sick groans, mist like enfold me from the search of eyes. Hark, how they knock, who's there? Romeo, arise, thou wilt be taken. Stay a while, stand up. <coughs> Run to my study, by and by, God's will, what simpleness is this? I come, I come. <coughs> Who knocks so hard? Whence come you? What's your will? Let me come in and you shall know my errand. I come from Lady Juliet. Welcome then. And he unlocks the door. Oh, holy friar, oh, tell me, holy friar, where's my lady's lord? Where's Romeo? There on the ground, with his own tears made drunk. So crying so much, he's drunk on his own tears. Oh, he is even in my mistress's case, just in her case. A oh, woeful sympathy, piteous predicament. Even so lies she. So she's saying Juliet is in the same state. Piteous predicament. Even so lies she, blubbering and weeping, weeping and blubbering. Stand up, stand up, stand up, and you be a man. For Juliet's sake, for her sake, rise and stand. Why should you fall into so deep an O? Oh. Nurse, he rises. Ah, sir, ah, sir, death's the end of all. Speaks thou of Juliet? How is it with her? Does she think me of an, does she think me an old murderer? Now I have stained the childhood of our joy with blood removed but little from her own. Where is she, and how doth she, and what says my concealed lady to our cancelled love? So he's asking if she thinks that he is a murderer now that she has corrupted their love by murdering somebody and shed the blood of somebody who is closely linked to her own blood, Tybalt. 
Oh, she says nothing, sir, but weeps and weeps and now falls on her bed and then starts up. And Tybalt calls and then on Romeo cries and then down falls again. As if that name shot from the deadly level of a gun did murder her as the name's cursed hand murdered his kinsman. Oh, tell me, friar, tell me, in what vile part of this anatomy doth my name lodge? Tell me that I may sack the hateful mansion. Here, Romeo uses that uh, metaphor, the hateful mansion, to refer to his own body. He wants to know where his name lies so that he can rip it out and stop torturing her. And remember earlier on, Juliet says, I have bought the mansion of love but not possessed it. So she uses the metaphor of a mansion to describe their relationship not being consummated and almost not being complete. He uses the word hateful mansion to describe his self and his own body and his own guilt. He offers to stab himself and the nurse snatches the dagger away. I've just highlighted this stage direction here and put histrionics. That just means melodramatic behaviour. You get the sense of how um, dramatic Romeo is being here. He's basically saying, oh, well, I may as well just stab myself. And, you know, all of this seems kind of overplayed and immature um, and, you know, overly um, emotional in the way he's dealing with this. The next part we have here is quite a long speech from the friar, okay? So we'll read the speech and then we'll talk about just some key annotations in a moment. Hold thy desperate hand. Art thou a man? Thy form cries out thou art. Thy tears are womanish. Thy wild acts denote the unreasonable fury of a beast. Unseemly woman in a seeming man and ill beseeming beast in seeming both. Thou hast amazed me. By my holy order, I thought thy disposition better tempered. Hast thou slayed Tybalt? Wilt thou slay thyself and thy lady that in thy life lives by doing damned hate upon thyself? Why railst thou upon thy birth, the heaven and the earth, since birth and heaven and earth all three do meet in thee at once, which thou at once wouldst lose? Fie, fie, thou shamed thy shape, thy love, thy wit, which like a user, usurer abounds in all, and usest none in that true use indeed, which should bedeck thy shape, thy love, thy wit. Thy noble shape is but a form of wax, digressing from the valour of a man. Thy, uh, thy dear love's warm but hollow perjury, killing that love which thou hast vowed to cherish. Thy wit, that ornament to shape and love, misshapen in the conduct of them both. Thy powder in the skillless soldier's flask is set afire by thine own ignorance. And thou dismembered with thine own defence, what rouse thee, man? Thy Juliet is alive. For whose dear sake thou wast but lately dead, there art thou happy. Tybalt would kill thee. But thou slewest Tybalt, there thou art happy. The law that threatened death becomes thy friend and turns it to exile, there art thou happy. A pack of blessings lies upon thy back, happiness courts thee in her best array. But like a misshaved and sullen wench, thou pouts upon thy fortune and thy love. Take heed, take heed, for such die miserable. Go get thee to thy love as was decreed. Ascend her chamber hence and comfort her. Okay, so let's just return to some of those key parts there that the friar has said. Okay, so first of all here, this whole speech is a tirade, which means kind of like a long, angry speech. The friar is furious at Romeo for being so ungrateful. And he's kind of launches this tirade against Romeo's desperation, this kind of sad act of ending his life. Um, because he feels that he would rather die than be exiled from Verona. And when he does this, he kind of pokes fun at him by reducing him to the level of an animal using animal imagery. He talks about his wild acts. He talks about him having the fury of a beast. He even compares him to a woman and says, come on, this would not be becoming for a woman, let alone a man. And that tells you a lot about the kind of um, responsibilities and roles of men and women. The idea that women are seen as hysterical, not men. In this society, it's considered to, to not be proper or, or sensible or masculine in terms of behaviour. He also warns him about his haste again. And he says, like powder is set afire by thine own ignorance. So the idea that, that you could be carrying kind of flammable uh, explosives and accidentally set them on fire yourself. He's talking about how hasty he is, how kind of hot and passionate he becomes. And 
there's this um, warning from earlier on, these violent delights have violent ends. Um, the friar is essentially saying, look, the, the prophecy is coming true. You need to calm yourself down here or you're going to make things ten times worse. So he's almost suggesting that Romeo is his own worst enemy. And this line, I think, is interesting because, remember, fate is an important one. And here, the friar says to him, you pout upon your fortune. You kind of complain and grumble about your fortune. And so he was reminding him about the idea that fate is fickle, fate changes. If you remember the idea about Boethius and the notion of the wheel, the idea that people's fates change from good things happening to bad things happen, and so bad things pass away and become good. He's reminding Romeo of the kind of short-lived nature of suffering and the fact that people's fates can change, and he's willing him to not wallow in pity because of that. Okay, final part of the scene now then. But look, thou shalt not stay till the watch be set. So he wills him to go to Juliet, but do not stay beyond daylight. For then thou canst not pass to Mantua, when thou shalt, li shalt live till we can find a time to blaze your marriage, reconcile your friends, beg pardon of the prince and call thee back. So he says, okay, we're going to send you to Mantua where you've been exiled. Tonight you can spend the night with Juliet and then you'll wait in Mantua while I figure out a plan, while I figure out a way to help you, get you back together with Romeo, get you par uh, with Juliet and get you pardoned by the prince. Uh, go before, nurse, commend me to thy lady, and bid her hasten all the house to bed, which heavy sorrow makes them apt unto. Romeo is coming. So he's going to be reunited with Juliet for one night only, their wedding night. Um, but he must leave before daylight. And again, night time is offering them some secrecy, some um, cover, some protection. Oh, Lord, I could have stayed here all night to hear good counsel. Oh, what learning is. My Lord, I'll tell my lady you will come. Do so, and bid my sweet prepare to chide. Nurse offers to go in and turns again. Here, sir, a ring she bid me give you. Hi, you, make haste, for it grows very late. How well my comfort is revived by this. Go hence, good night, and here stands all your state. Either be gone before the watch be set, or by the break of day disguised from hence. Sojourn in Mantua, so wait for us in Mantua. I'll find out your man, and he shall signify from time to time every good hap to you that chances here. So he's saying, I will send word to you in Mantua. Spend the night with your wife tonight. I will spend, send word to you in Mantua. Give me thy hand. Tis late. Farewell. Good night. But there's a joy past, but there's a joy past joy, he calls out to me. It were a grief so brief to part with thee. Farewell. So, through this news from the friar, the idea that he can be reunited with Juliet for one evening and the friar is determined to devise a plan, Romeo's mood um, transforms again. You get the sense of this fickle nature of his, of his mood. Um, one minute he was supremely depressed. Now he's filled with joy at the idea of being with Juliet again. So the two of them will now spend their wedding night together before Romeo is exiled and before the friar's plan, whatever that plan will be, to get them back together is put into motion. Okay, well done. That's the end of Act 3, Scene 3.